I'm John Nakahara. I'm the moderator for today's panel on connecting communities. We have a great panel to, to talk with us today on uh, all the opportunities that are out there to address some of the critical needs that we all came to know uh, during COVID, including challenges on uh, education, healthcare, employment, social engagement, kind of keeping up with your families, all of those types of things and how, the, how much the world has changed because of COVID and, and new practices that, that we all have to be able to engage in. So our panel here today is to help us with that and to help us understand the tremendous opportunities. There's a lot of money um, that's being, that has been uh, authorized to be spent in these areas um, uh, and real opportunities for our communities to uh, take advantage of and try to, try to, try to extend uh, digital uh, access, affordability, and literacy. So with that, I will introduce our panel. Um, we are very fortunate to have Paul Rule Desai, who's a, a Director of Congressional Affairs at the National Telecommunications and Information Administration in the Department of Commerce, which is a huge mouthful. <laughs> um, she'll tell us more about what, she, what, that, what, what NTIA does, but it is the most important agency that you've never heard of in this space. <laughs> at least as of today. At least as, as of today. Maybe not in a year or two. Yeah. <laughs> um, sitting to Powell's uh, left is uh, Meredith Williams. She's Assistant Vice President of Executive Branch at AT&T, and she's their subject matter expert on broadband access and adoption. We have to, to Powell's right is Meredith, uh, I'm sorry, to, to, to Nguyen, uh, uh, Executive Director of OCA. I mean, OCA has been a real, for those that don't know, OCA has been a real leader in this space. Um, and we have Maya Wagner from Dell, uh, who's uh, the lead uh, for, at Dell for Digital Inclusion Strategy, and she leads that portfolio at Dell. And on the far end is June Kim, Associate Vice President of External Affairs for Comcast. He works with the uh, with ANHPI groups on broadband affordability and digital equity. And among other things, he's also on the board of AAGC of Southern California. So he's been very involved in the community. So with that, I think we'll start off. I'm going to kick the first question. Uh, and what we'll do here is I'll have, we have a series of questions for the panel, and then um, we'll have time for audience questions as we get towards the end. So if you have questions, hold them, and we will get to them. So. Um, so my first question is for, for our role, and uh, as I said, NTI is the most important agency that you hadn't heard of before today. Um, uh, but Harul, maybe you could explain a little bit about who NTI is and the significant role Congress has given NTI in working with the states and the communities to connect people and extend broadband. Sure. Thanks, John, and thanks to you all for coming out today. This is my first time at this conference, so I feel really lucky to have been invited and to speak with all of you. Um, as John said, NTIA is a small agency within commerce. We are the president's uh, advisor on telecommunications and information issues. Um, but it's also a very exciting time to be at NTIA. Not only are we celebrating 45 years tomorrow of our existence, yay, um, but uh, Congress also, through the bipartisan infrastructure law, tasked us with connecting everyone in America and gave us nearly $48 billion to do that. Um, and we have, we're doing that through various different programs. So we have $42.45 billion that Congress gave us in what's called the B program. That stands for Broadband Equity Access and Deployment. And that's a program that um, it's, a, it's formula funded. It'll, it'll be funded through a formula. All states and territories will get a certain amount of money. We'll be uh, announcing how much each state and territory will get next month. But they will be able to use that money to serve the unserved. So whether it's through infrastructure, whether it's through equity, whether it's through adoption, um, but this will be led by the states. Uh, each state, um, pretty much each state has a state broadband office that's creating a plan. So you should be working with your uh, state government. Um, they are supposed to be working with local communities and doing local coordination as they create their plan. This plan includes what areas are unserved, how do they want to get um, those areas served, what are the digital equity plans. Um, so states are creating their plans now and they are supposed to be taking input from their local community. So um, if you have, uh, so you should definitely reach out to your state representatives to, to provide input if you are able to. 
Um, we also received $2.75 billion for digital equity. These are three different programs. Um, states will have uh, access, again, through funding, a funding formula to use this money for uh, digital adoption. So we always say it's nice, it, we should have access to the internet, but if you don't know how to use it or can't afford it, it doesn't really help, right? And so this is money that can go towards digital literacy, uh, digital adoption, affordability. Um, so states will have access to this money, but there's also a competitive grant program that any stakeholder can compete for. And so that's also part of um, our effort to get uh, to connect everybody in America. We also have the Middle Mile program, which like NTIA, I feel like no one really knows about and thinks it's very under the radar. But uh, we had $1, 1 billion for Middle Mile, and this is really the heart of the internet. It's the infrastructure that connects all the homes and the last mile to the home. Um, and we, that it was a, we, we had one point one. We had one billion dollars for that program. Uh, we'll probably be making an announcements soon, but it was it was highly oversubscribed. So that lets you know that this is uh, that this the building out of this infrastructure is important, and um, more money is probably still needed to to get this out there. Um, we also, through the bipartisan infrastructure law, received uh, two billion dollars to connect tribal communities. This is on top of $1 billion that we received the Consolidated Appropriations Act, um, again, to connect tribal communities. This is direct funding, not loans, but direct funding for tribal communities to use for either infrastructure or adoption purposes. To date, we have given out 1.7, over $1.75 billion to tribal communities to help them in their um, digital adoption e efforts. And then finally, I want to mention a program which is not a part of the bipartisan infrastructure law. It was part of the Consolidated Appropriations Act. Um, but there was a pilot program that was included in that law that gave us a little over um, $250 million for uh, HBCUs and other minority serving institutions. This was a competitive grant program um, that would help schools buy equipment, train people on technology. Um, that was a pilot program, so that money has already been expended. Um, we expended all the money earlier this year, but that was also another program that we uh, administered to, again, help uh, connect everybody. So those are some of our programs. Happy to answer more questions later, but um, highly encourage everybody, if you haven't heard about any of these programs, um, I'm happy to talk more later, but definitely these are important programs, I think, to get all communities con connected, and we are um, committed to trying to connect everybody. And Paul Roll, just to be clear, does does native are native Hawaiians included in tribal? Um, I believe so, because uh, I know the Hawaiian lands um, all in Hawaii. They have, yep, yeah, yes. Great. So, so, June, I wanted to turn to you next because Comcast has has a tremendous record of being a leading provider of affordable broadband. Really, kind of broke the mold early on with the internet essentials and all of that. Um, <coughs> There's been a couple of important uh, pieces of legislation built on those efforts and, and many others. Um, and I was hoping you could help give the, the audience a, a, a sense of the current programs that are out there to help low-income consumers afford broadband and what some of the gaps you see in the efforts are. Thank you, John. Um, thank you for having me here today. Um, I'm also a board member of APEX. So. I think we should have <laughs> mentioned that since we're at the Legislative uh, Leadership Summit. Um, so to go back to uh, John's question, so uh, out of ARPA, the Emergency Broadband Benefit was created, EBB, which gave a $50 a month um, stipend, basically, uh, to help cover the cost of the internet. Um, that program, coming out of the infrastructure bill, turned into ACP, which is the Affordable Connectivity Program. Um, that program now has 17 million households, I believe, um, and it's continuing to rise. Uh, that gives $30 a month to help pay, pay for broadband. Um, the, the White House announcement with uh, the president and the, um, the, uh, the vice president, um, it was interesting because uh, the, the, the woman that spoke about how the internet changed her and her family's lives from uh, I believe Delaware. Um, she's one of our customers and she's one of our Internet Essentials um, customers. 
that uh, found the affordable connectivity program and connected um, at a reduced rate. Now, that program actually, the good thing about it is all of the um, ISPs that are a part of it had to create programs specific to ACP um, in order to get that um, $30 a month credit. And just uh, to ISPs, internet service providers. Right? Internet so service providers. So AT&T, Comcast, yeah. Verizon, Starlink, yeah. whatever. So. Um, mm -hmm. That also, right now, according to either the CBO or, you know, depending on who you talk to, that program's actually going to run out of funding in 2024. Um, so I don't know. I mean, taking my Comcast hat off and putting my political hat on, which I had on for 21 years, like... I couldn't imagine 17 million households being mad at me if I was an elected official, but <laughs> they are probably going to hold that and try to do something with it, right? Um, outside of that, going to some of the um, some of the funding that Parole mentioned, you know, what we've been doing at Comcast is working with our partners and working with um, third parties that we have a relationship with to talk to them about digital inclusion. Um, and digital navigator programs. I know other folks here um, will speak to it. Uh, and OCA is one of our partners. And there is a lot of money out there, right? Like we keep on hearing like things like $4 trillion of federal funding bills passed since um, this administration came in. Like, I think when people hear 4 trillion, like they just hear the four and they don't actually know how many zeros are in a trillion. But that is like, what, 400,000 organizations getting a million dollars or something something ridiculous like that, if I'm doing the math right? <laughs> I am Asian, but math might not be my problem. Um, take, take that off the video. Uh, <laughs> but like it, like, it is literally enough money to change people's lives. I think before the pandemic, uh, Folks at Brookings and um, other places were saying about $80 million, $80 billion will get everybody in America connected, right? Right now, you have between ARPA infrastructure and um, other federal funding bills, somewhere around $450 billion, right? Like, that can actually close the digital divide. That can actually stop like the next pandemic or next wave where we're all working from home from seeing photos of kids doing homework inside a McDonald's or from a McDonald's parking lot, right? Like, and I think the big part about this is for organizations in states um, to actually, you know, take parole up on our offer, take me up on my offer to actually talk to us about all, all the funding that's available because like we can, we, we can fix this problem. And it's not just with ACP, it's with like the whole entire gamut of money out there. But that's probably a good segue to two. Because <laughs> OCA has been successful at at least pursuing some of this money, although more, than, more I'm sure that you're going to pursue. Um, but maybe you could talk a little bit about that and your efforts there, and, and but also if people are with state, local, state and local organizations, how do they even find out who the broadband office is or what's a broadband office? These folks. <laughs> you contact these folks right here. Um, but so just a quick refresher for those of you who are not familiar with OCA. We're the second oldest national Asian American civil rights organization that is actually chapter and volunteer based. We have 35 active chapters in 24 states, uh, but headquartered here in D.C. And so um, we were one of two API organizations that receive the FCC's ACP outreach um, uh, grant, which is really, which is really sad, uh, because we were the only API national organization that received the max funding of seven hundred forty thousand, and there was one other local um, Korean American community center in LA that received um, funding for their local community. But we know that um, the API community desperately needs. Uh, this uh, support because there are many um, APIs out there that are overlooked 
um, in the digital <coughs> divide, right? There's this number floating around by Pew Research that says, oh, 98% of Asian Americans have access to the internet. But what does that actually look like, right? We don't have the disaggregated data. The FCC maps, um, the FCC broadband maps don't actually have disaggregated data for where our A AANHPI is not connected to the internet. And so OCA has been trying, um, and Advancing Justice AJC, we've both been trying to take a stab at looking and finding this disaggregated data. We have a digital access survey um, that we are wrapping up right now in our findings and, and currently in the re report stage. But just from, and our survey was done uh, in 10 languages, but just from the English respondents, about 5,000 of them, 15% have said that they only have internet at home through a cellular or hotspot connection. And 1% um, from that 5,000 don't have any internet at all at home. And 6% of that, uh, those respondents uh, only have a smartphone as their digital device. And 7% only have a desktop computer as their digital device. And 7% only have a laptop as their digital device, right? And so, um, you know, when we saw during the pandemic, these youth who were kicked off of campuses, um, NHPI students at community colleges as well as four-year universities didn't have access to devices and didn't have access to internet at home. Um, we're still trying to bridge that gap like today, even though we're starting to see some of the schools come back to in-person, right? And so for us uh, as a civil rights org working um, historically on things like civic engagement and immigration, um, we do have that grassroots connection, right? And a lot of um, both national and grassroots organizations, you have connection to community. A lot of that is like canvassing efforts, right? You talk to constituents. And so for us to tap into the FCC funding, um, we basically just stacked it on top of our get out the vote campaign campaign work, right? We already have that infrastructure. If we're already knocking on doors, calling people, asking them if they've registered to vote, it's another, you know, 30 seconds to say, hey, have you heard of the Affordable Connectivity Program? Do you have internet at home? Can we get you um, more information to to enroll into the program, right? Because it's not just a $30 credit towards your internet plan. You can also receive a one-time $100 discount on a device, which is, I think, one of the most unrated, underrated pieces, under-marketed pieces of the ACP program. Um, and so I, you know, working with API Votes and our tech comp, uh, partners, AT&T, Comcast Charter, T-Mobile, Verizon, um, we're trying to, I know, like, internet access, I think, is kind of like a, um, it's kind of scary or intimidating, uh, you know, subject for like API gr uh, groups, right? Because they're just so used to things like civic engagement and immigration work and digital divide seems like such a, a beast. But I think um, we want to work with community organizations to try to tap into this because you already have the infrastructure um, and the programming. We just need to tack this on, right? It's just as simple as flyering um, and the educational piece, like, yeah, you reach out to Comcast, AT&T, um, NTIA, of course, as the federal <laughs> body for this, um, and FCC to, you know, if you don't know who your state broadband officer is, like, that's what they're there for. They'll connect you to them. So I'll just, I'll just stop there. Yeah. Um, so maybe Meredith, you know, AT&T, of course, is one of the nation's leading broadband providers, um, chaired by my old boss, <laughs> <laughs> Bill Kennard. Um, but we, um, we've talked a little bit about affordability, but all the surveys indicate that's not the only, I mean, that's a huge, that has been a huge barrier to people getting broadband, of course, was one of the key objectives of the Affordable Connectivity Program, but it's not the only object, only, only barrier. And maybe, I know the AT&T's done look, a lot of work looking at this, and maybe you could help us address that. Sure, happy to. But before we go any further, if you go on to internetforall.gov, there's a nice map there, and you can find out who your state broadband office is. <laughs> so everyone keeps mentioning it, and I just want to make sure people have very easy access to that. Thank you for that plug. <laughs> I, it's a great resource. Um, so, you know, we've talked a lot about the affordability uh, question here and the affordability gap that there is with uh, Internet access. Um, and, of course, there is the sort of baseline gap of do you have a connection that goes to your home where you live? But, you know, there's data out there, and... Numbers may vary slightly, but somewhere around 90 plus percent of Americans have um, access to uh, home internet. So that's sort of barrier one. But when you look at these other two barriers, when you look at affordability, and then when you really look at the last barrier, right? So like, let's say you have a connection at home, you 
figure out how to you know sign up for ACP, which by the way, when it first came out, you could only sign up by going online. Think about that for a second. That's why community organizations are so important. Um, but then what do you do with it, especially in communities of color, especially in communities who didn't previously have a connection to the internet? And so teaching people you know, digital literacy skills, teaching them how to get online, um, what are the best resources for them to use? You know, how do you, I, you know, exercise critical thinking online about what sites to go to and what not to? That's sort of the last barrier there. And so you know, we've been doing a couple of things. We're not alone in them. And we've been doing them by working with community partners because we can't do it here from DC. We can't do it from a corporate headquarters. You have to go into the community and do it. Um, and so whether it's handing out you know, devices to people who cannot afford them, because that is one of the primary gaps, um, whether it's refurbished devices or working with some of our partners like Dell on getting devices into the hands of community members. And then what we've also been doing, and again, I, I say this and also say we're not special, we're not the only ones, but it's really important is we've been building, um, you know, I call them computer labs because I grew up in a time when we had computer labs in schools. I don't know if that's still the case. <laughs> um, connect, connected learning centers uh, in community centers around the country. So rather than the separate place you go to take these classes, we partner with community organizations who have strong relationships in the community and build these community, computer labs there. And then people from the community can come in, whether it's a Boys and Girls Club or in San Francisco, the Asian Pacific American Community Center. They can come in, they can learn how to get online, there can be someone there if they have questions, there's someone there who could talk to them if they don't know where to sign up for the ACP, so they can also get internet at home. All of these things are really important, and these are sort of, sort of the last bridge, if you will, to really getting folks online. Um, and we're happy to do this. I know a lot of our other, you know, ISPs, internet service providers, are happy to do this. Um, but as Perul mentioned, there's also $2.75 billion out there just for digital equity. Um, and it's a great way for other community organizations to get involved and help get people online, bring in trainers, bring in um, digital inclusion facilitators and all those types of things. Because really, you know, working within the community is the way you're going to sort of get that last group of people connected because it has to be working with someone that they trust um, and it has to be at a level that they feel comfortable. So we think that's really important. So I want to turn to Amaya, who's with Dell. And, you know, I think we all know Dell because I mean, how many of us haven't had a Dell at some point in time? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Maya, maybe you could talk a little bit about, from your perspective, how Dell and companies like Dell can help. You're obviously not a service provider, you're, but you can't use the internet without right. something to use the internet. Absolutely, <laughs> yes. I was vigorously nodding my head when Meredith was speaking because, um, absolutely, I mean, what Dell is, Dell is very concerned about the three billion people around the world that are not connected to the internet today, but what is of even more concern is that despite um, there being connectivity for a lot of people, 50% of the world is not engaged in the digital economy. Um, and, and that's a problem because everything is digital. So all of the opportunities now require this experience, this understanding of how the digital landscape works. So we are focusing on that participation gap, um, coming in with a lot of programs that build the skills to use the devices and the technology once you have it. But one thing I just want to, I could like literally regurgitate what a lot of these people have been saying, but one of the things that I think is really important to highlight um, <clears throat> is that there is a lot of money. We have enough to, to bridge the digital divide in the United States. Like that's a pretty big deal. Why is it not happening? And I think this is what we're seeing with a lot of the issues that, we're, that this country is facing. Um, and it's, we're all working in silos. We're all, we're working alone. So yeah. Dell takes the approach of, doing everything in ecosystem and in partnership. Um, so we are sitting at the table with, with two of our proud partners, Comcast and AT&T, because we don't bring the connectivity to the table, but we do have strong partnerships um, with, with customers and, and business partners that, that enable that connectivity. And then we could say, all right, what does Dell bring to the table? Maybe in some cases where we are building an AT&T connected learning center, we will equip that lab with the devices they need. Or in the case of internet essentials, we will offer a even more discounted rate for a device if you sign up with Comcast. Um, and that is, those are ways that we can create sort of mutually beneficial arrangements for community members. Um, but again, if Dell were to try to do all of that by ourselves, it would cost a lot more money and we wouldn't get as much done. So I think it's just, can we all rally around the same goal of getting um, marginalized communities online, and getting them the skills they need to use the access to the technology once they have it, 
um, and and start working together and take advantage of all the of all the dollar bills. <laughs> yeah, let me let me see if we why don't we take a see if we have questions from the audience. Anybody have a question? No questions. All right, we'll have to make up more questions. Who's there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and, and can you identify yourself? Yes, and, yes, uh, yes. Hi, Dean Rodan. I'm from Senator Hirona's office. Um, I just have a, a very broad question, and feel free, anyone, to, to chime in. But uh, what are some of the unique challenges of providing internet service in the US territories in the Pacific? And how do you see us overcoming them? Thank you. Anybody want to take that? I'll jump in first. That's a really broad <laughs> question. <laughs> Um, I mean, I think we've already talked about one of the challenges, and we've also talked about one of the solutions, which is money, um, right? Some of these places, you know, some of the places that are not yet served, right, are because they're very expensive to serve. I'm not kidding when I tell you that there are already uh, grant programs out there in the states that paid $100,000, $267,000 for a single location to get broadband. Mm -hmm. um, it's super important, but that's also really, really, really expensive. Um, so. You know, we've, we've got the funding. Um, June and Peru have gone very deep on what we have there. Um, but I do think this part that we've been talking about a lot, and I just, we, I don't think we can talk about it enough, is sort of the digital literacy, digital, digital equity piece of it. There are, I was at a conference with um, state ed education technology uh, directors, and, you know, one of them was talking about, you know, in her state, she lives, she's a state sort of in the, um, South Central part of the United States, and she said, "You know, there's a there's a few people in our community who just think I don't need the internet, I don't want it. We at the school we're going to provide hotspots to your kids. We're going to give you free internet at home so the kids can learn." And the parents saying, "No, thank you." So I mean, things like that. I don't need, I don't actually have the answer to that question, but I will tell you that it's anywhere from we don't have a device to use. We were talking before this panel started about places. You know, a lot of families are still relying on a mobile device, including a mobile phone for home internet. Um, and so you think about that to, you know, people who don't see the need. And I think that that's um, probably one of the most challenging barriers to overcome. Oh, go ahead. I'll just add very, I don't have the answer to that broad question. But what I will point out uh, uh, to follow up on what Meredith said was our funding under the B program, which is the large chunk of money, um, the focus and the priority is to get to unserved and underserved areas. So our hope is that um, in a, you know, where there doesn't make a business case sense to cover some of those areas, that this money will be used to cover those harder to reach areas. Can I, can I also add that, um, so we, during the pandemic, had uh, gotten support to send laptops out to on a PZ, um, or students from Asian American, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander serving institutions who were kicked home from school and didn't have a laptop at home. And uh, we sent a number of laptops out to Hawaii. Um, I, I was the one like buying laptops with this funding we got and trying to send it out to these students in Hawaii. And um, the difficulty was actually the mailing address. Like I couldn't get a laptop to some of the students and I ended up having to work with um, one of the community colleges to send to their campus instead through actually uh, one of the Dell programs. And so um, I think what isn't represented on this panel is actually someone from the government because I think infrastructure has a lot to do, like, you know, I, I think government needs to be called in to work with private um, in terms of deployment, which is like the building out piece, um, which we haven't addressed yet. Well, that's right. That, yeah. That's what I'm here for. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. I'm not city. Sorry. State you government. Local. Local government. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Federal, federal yeah. one's here. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. City. Yeah. Infrastructure in the city. Well, and uh, I will also add on the address part, like, and I've only been at Comcast for two years, and I had no idea about any of this, right? Like, when it came to franchise agreements, right? So, like, how many of you guys remember when the Biden administration started sending out um, COVID test kits? And we kept on hearing all these, like, stories about... Oh, you know, somebody already used my address. <laughs> Raise your hands. Do you guys remember yeah, this? Yeah. Like, people literally couldn't get it, mm -hmm. right? Um, so when it comes to cable operations, we can only serve addresses that are, like, in existence, right? So there are, um, what is it, single-room occupancy buildings in places like San Francisco, right, where it's just one address, and every single, like, room is a different family. Like, we are by law not allowed to serve every single one of those rooms with a separate service, right?
that is just how like the the rules are written, right? And we wish we can get past it, but like, like it is so complex and it is hard to explain unless you have examples like the COVID test kits, right? There are also places like in Philadelphia, like Pew did a research study for us. Philadelphia has like some of the highest concentrations of unlicensed rental units in any urban area, like major metropolitan area in the United States, right? Which means if you have a single family home that the owners who've had this place for the past 15 years, 20 years, decide to rent it out to each floor to a different family, right? As a cable provider, we can only provide it to that one address and all the families have to share that one single access, right? So is that like, you know, reason to call Comcast and yell at one of our customer service folks? <laughs> I mean, I would. <laughs> right? Um, I think all of us would. But, like, that's not actually going to fix the problem. Like, again, like, it, it's going to take local, state, and federal resources in order to fix problems like that. Um, to go to your question, I've actually been to a lot of the Pacific Islands. It's a whole lot of ocean um, and, like, very small pipes because it costs a lot of money, mm -hmm. like Meredith said. Oh, part of it is part of it's just getting to the island, yeah. right? yes. let alone <laughs> distributing on the yeah. island. Yeah. So. I'm Clev Mesador. I work for the Blockchain Foundation. And it's startling for me because in the crypto space, we've seen adoption off the charts globally because in Asia, when you look at countries like India or even Latin America, Brazil, people have the mobile phone and they don't have to deal with the connectivity issue. And I'm Haitian American. I remember going home a few years ago. There was in a remote mountainous community, there was a man on a donkey that was his most that was his only mode of transportation on a phone. I asked him who he was on the phone with in a mountain community in Haiti. He said he was on the phone with his cousin in Germany. <laughs> so people can't get hot water, sorry, people can't get clean water in a lot of con remote countries, but they, they have access to a mobile phone. And so that is one of the biggest challenges here, right? It is because this issue of broadband is we are having to go through so many things to get people connected where in emerging areas people have been able to do that. I wonder if the issue is a lot of this funding is great. I, I actually previously worked at EDA at the Department of Commerce. I worked in the Obama administration. Is the fact that these grants, because a lot of this funding is dependent on grants, very few people in our in communities of color can even get those grants. So as a result, the people who qualify and learn the, 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 the system and have a pathway to get the grants, they're the same one. So the funding keeps gets circulating in the same people, but the impact is not different. You can get the money out, but if it's still going to the same groups, the only groups that can qualify for the funding, you're not going to have that impact. Is there a way to change the way we distribute federal funding other than to these grant programs? Because these micro entities and these Commun remote communities, they probably have a better pathway to get resources or plans for their communities than the organizations that can qualify for grants. So I think Meredith has mentioned it too, has mentioned it like, and I know uh, at Comcast, we try and work with a lot of different partners, right? Um, and it doesn't matter how big you are, it doesn't matter what your, um, what your uh, uh, yearly budget is, right? Um, I think, and you know, one of the, the, one of the groups that I'm working with currently, like two said, is API Vote, right? They have never done anything like this before when it comes to the digital divide. They don't really do anything when it comes to, you know, connectivity, right? The reason that I started working with them and then pulled in OCA, pulled in JACO, pulled in all these other different organizations who don't work on those things is because previously they had worked on um, the affordable care program. Oh, the Affordable Care Act, right? Getting Asian American communities signed up for health care, right, after Obamacare passed. They all work on census programs, right? They all, like two said, go out and knock on doors, talk to people about voters, voting, and, like, the importance of civic engagement, right? Um, most recently, they probably all worked on the COVID vaccination efforts, right, within our communities, right? So being a digital navigator, doing digital inclusion work, talking to somebody about whether or not they have a device or whether or not they have, they know about the ACP program, 
should not be anything different than what they've already had conversations with these folks about. And like you said, they probably know like the people that need it the most, right, within their own communities. One, one thing I want to ask, following up on our question, is, is there's, there's a little bit of a difference between mobile phone access yeah. and broadband access, right? And maybe somebody could explain a little bit why. Because the mobile phones have been, if you look at all the statistics for low-income communities, mobile phone is the predominant way that a low-income community, low, the low-income individuals have phone service. It's also been predominantly the way that they've had data access or some form of broadband access, but maybe a little bit more about what maybe help people understand a little bit more about some of the differences there. I'm happy to. If you want, we do both. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, so, you know, both are important. I don't think we should ever lose that. And to your point, having a mobile phone, um, especially less so in the United States, but in a lot of places in the world, they never actually had a wireline phone. So having a mobile phone is the first time they've really been able to communicate. It's so important. I mean, I could talk for hours about how it helps women, especially, and start businesses in um, developing parts of the world. But we're talking about the United States, I think, mostly here. Um, and so I think, again, mobile phones are great. They do provide a lot of the resources that people need and a lot of the benefits of connectivity, right? You can talk to family members. You can do um, a telehealth you know, appointment on your phone. But um, you know, a lot of the stuff we're doing today, and this has really even just evolved over the past three or four years, requires so much bandwidth and requires larger screens. And I think that's why we've been working so closely with partners like Dell to get you know, actual devices in people's hands, because it's really hard to write a term paper on your mobile phone. Um, and it's really hard to have three people in your household be on video calls, like a Zoom class and on a call for work and um, you know, and a telehealth appointment all on one mobile connection, whether you're using it as a hotspot or however you're using it. And so it's not a, um, it's not either or, it's, it's a both really. Um, but I think if you, especially you're talking about what people are able to do at home and you're talking about people who um, may not be able to get out into the community as much for whatever reason, they don't have good transportation, they're older, um, any of those things, being able to do it from their home means that having a connection that can do all of those things is really important. And that's why we think that having a fixed broadband line at home is really important for folks. Because you know what? You can also use your mobile phone on your Wi-Fi. So it actually works for folks <laughs> it's in your home. Yeah, and I think uh, uh, most of the internet service providers now who do both, mm -hmm. right, have packages that fit into the ACP program where you can get a mobile, uh, a mobile plan plus a, a more like plan. Um, uh, another couple of like anecdotal stories I heard were, you know, if you are that family sharing that like one mobile hotspot, right, coming off your iPhone or your Android phone, and say dad decides he has to go run to the hardware store, like your house now has, no longer has internet connection, right? Um, the other thing is one of my friends here in Washington, D.C., Alistair Chang, he's a school board member, um, and, one of the, and he got elected in 2020, in the November 2020 election. And one of the stories that he heard was at the very beginning of the pandemic, D.C. public schools started giving out MiFi devices, right? A um, couple different problems here, but like parent, the kids would get the MiFi device, they would take it home. Parents wouldn't know how to use it, which leads to digital navigation issues, digital inclusion issues, right? Just like digital equity. Um, on top of that, like they would they would know how to use a MiFi device. They would set it up in inside like the interior room or something like that, like where there wasn't really good signal, right? And then they would be like, "Oh, this is this is not working because it was free, right?" And they would just toss it in the trash, right? So. Yeah, you, you, you need both, right? You actually need to not only give people the devices, but as all of us have said, like, you have to teach them how to use it. More questions? How much time do we have left? <laughs> Three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so let me just ask the panel, that one, if you have anything else you want to share, but also... Maybe for other people here, a little bit of how you got into doing what you're doing. Oh, well, I know you, you have like the yeah. world's longest list. <laughs> sure. And, and, and also like incredibly um, diverse. Um, it's funny, like being on this panel. Um, I started my journey in 2005 on these issues. Uh, I worked at, and I spent time at two different nonprofits in getting funding 
for bridging the digital divide was very difficult then because no one understood the importance of the internet and broadband access. Um, so it's, it's kind of come full circle now that I'm working at an agency that is spending billions of dollars to do this work. Um, but it's been a fun, interesting journey. But yeah, back in 2005, we were begging for money to do more work, to work with local organizations, be partnered with a lot of local organizations to get organizations who didn't work on these issues to understand why the communities um, should be focused on um, uh, bridging the digital divide. So i um, worked at different nonprofits. I've worked at the FCC, I've worked on the Hill, and now I'm here at NTIA, and I just feel like everything's come full circle with, um, with my advocacy, and now it's fun to kind of implement this, these efforts. Um, my path is very different, <laughs> also windy though. Um, I started my career in public broadcasting, so um, you know, it was, it was fantastic. I was talking about last week about how amazing it was. I worked for the federal government on issues um, completely separate from this, on national security issues. Uh, and then I came to AT&T. Um, and you know, someone might look at my career and say, you know, why? Like, what, why did you do all these things? And uh, one of my leaders said to me recently, he said, it seems like you are mission driven and you look for roles where you get to serve the community. And I do think that to Perul's point, you know, the importance of internet, the importance of connectivity um, and making sure, you know, especially after COVID that everyone has all of the benefits that come with connectivity is so important. And so I feel really honored to be able to do that today. Um, I mean, how I got to OCA was I just liked connecting people um, and also playing the role of um, having one foot in policy and one foot in culture and being able to translate kind of um, these complex policy things into everyday uh, terminology and, and concepts. But I think for OCA, we just launched a new uh, policy platform this year actually, and it consists of three things, bridging the digital divide, addressing intergenerational well-being, um, and fighting for voting rights, right? And it's because we recognize that um, while OCA has for the past 50 years, we turned 50 this year, um, has worked on immigration, education, and other things, it's now time to start turning to kind of going up the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right, going up the pyramid and say, saying that we need to address digital um, equity uh, today, um, especially after the pandemic. And so um, for us, that's being on the grounds, that's where our niche is. Um, and we work with our other API counterparts um, in, in the tech policy, but we're here for the adoption piece, um, digital literacy education piece. Why? Yeah, I, I think just for the last comments on my side, if there's anything that you walk away with today is that the digital divide is not a black and white issue. There's a spectrum. So we're talking about levels of connectivity, how much, you know, um, how much broadband uh, you know, access do you have at home to be able to do all the things you want to do. So like what we're looking at is a pretty complex problem with like lots of different, um, lots of different potential solutions. So I guess it's just, it's not black and white. We can't just say, yes, we've connected a community, we're good to go. I think we've all recognized that there's a lot more work to do and that will also continue to evolve as technology changes. So join us, help us bridge the digital <laughs> divide. There's a ton of work to do. Um, but my path at, to get to Dell Technologies, I come from the nonprofit sector. I did a lot of community engagement work. And so that sort of, Get going deep in communities, working with local partners that can really sort of galvanize people in community to create change. Um, that's how Dell does things, and so my experience comes um, comes in to connect the dots between big corporation and in our communities on the ground. Sure. Wow. Um, so I, like, I think I mentioned earlier, I spent 21 years working in a democratic and progressive politics. Um, in the fall of 2020, I figured as an immigrant I had done enough after working on um, the Gore Lieberman campaign, the John Kerry, Kerry Edwards campaign, um, Obama, as well as Biden campaigns. Um, and I did it in 39 different states and four different, three different countries at this point. So um, I was looking for a way to retire from politics. And that's when somebody called me from Comcast to talk about a position in their external affairs department where I get to work with uh, national, state, and local API organizations to talk to them about some of the issues that we discussed here, as well as um, center and left organizations, um, which kind of made sense because most of the center and left organizations I work with were my previous clients at my consulting firm. Um, so it's been a pretty easy transition. Um, I also think, having worked in politics, I kind of see things differently, right, in terms of how to organize, how to message things, how to 
how to talk about things in a way in which I think um, policymakers sometimes make it really, really complicated with their multi-thousand page bills. Um, but to uh, Maya's point, we, we, we can actually fix this. I think one of my biggest worries is that, um, and I mentioned this for parole, like it is so complicated and convoluted the way that the funding structure works that like, and because nobody has actually like read the bills except for people probably at NTIA, right? Um, uh, like, you know, you can go to internet, internetforall.gov, right? But then you call the, the broadband, state broadband office and then what do you do, right? Like you, you have to work with community partners, you have to work with both public and private entities in order to like figure out the right conversations to have because you can't just go there and like, you know, yell and scream and whatever about, you know, whether or not you need more money. You actually need to be able to prove your point. And I think organizations like OCA and JACL, API Vote, Apex, et cetera, give us that opportunity to be able to do it and do it in a very smart way. And I will say, I mean, though I, I got here, I worked, uh, I've been in private practice for over 20 years, but I was five years on the Hill uh, working for Joe Lieberman and four years at the FCC working for the two chairmen, as I said. Um, there are a lot, of, there are actually more than you see and more that you've seen, uh, A, A and HPI um, resources in Washington, D.C. Uh, people like me um, who have been in government, have lots of experience, know these different programs, can help community organizations uh, figure out what some of these programs are. And we'll do it if it's nonprofit organization. I'll do it for free. <laughs> you know, it's part of my bar obligation. <laughs> so, um, you know, there are resources. There are people that we that you, that the organizations can reach out to for help here. So, all right. Well, I'd like to thank all of our panelists very much. Please join me. Thank you.